The Trump administration's tough stance on foreign trade and tariffs have given a boost to the U.S. steel industry, and U.S. steel here in our region is no exception. Revenue and earnings are up, and the Pittsburgh-based company has been reopening and investing in facilities across the country. Yet some on Wall Street have wondered, is this a new era, or does it only last as long as current federal trade policies do? And we're back with CEO David Burt of U.S. Steel. See you again. Great to be here. How about that? That seems to be the big question, and I I look at the, the, the back and forth on Wall Street among the analysts and they say, sure, this is all good right now, but if there's a change of heart in Washington, this party's going to be over. Good. Well, I, I think for the foreseeable future, we can count on the Section 232 related to trade that the president's put in place to continue. And uh, the reason it needs to be in place, we do need this level playing field, but it's important to understand why do we have this related to steel? And it comes down to is steel is absolutely vital to national security, not just from a, a military perspective for building that type of equipment, but also from an economic security standpoint. So to the extent people understand that, they, they know that it's the right thing to do. And the other thing is you look at the economy, you look at how the economy is performing in, ter in terms of uh, employment issues. Not only have we increased uh, the number of people that, that work in steel across the United States, but for example, the statistic that uh, ran from July 2017 to July 2018, uh, the number of manufacturing jobs created was the highest number since 1984. So clearly it's doing the right thing. It's making sure that we do have this, this gem of uh, the steel industry to, to be here so that we can manufacture things. If your supply chain is relying on people outside the country, you're really never safe. Yeah. You have to make sure that you make things in this country. You have to be a manufacturer to have good, sustainable jobs and a good, sustainable future. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I had Dave Roderick on the show 30 years ago uh -huh. saying a lot of the same things. You all seem to have uh, the, the attention uh, inside the Beltway today that the industry's never really been able to achieve in all these years. Well, I think it's a it's a good understanding this national security issue because as manufacturing was continuously exiting the United States, now we're seeing jobs actually come back to the United States with big multinational companies understanding that this is a great place to do business and that's not just good for the economy of the United States, it's good for the people. And that's what really matters, good manufacturing jobs here in the United States. A lot of big questions. One is what the uh, how the, the, the trade situation with China is going to shake out. Is that really the big uh, the, the big problem area? Well, the, the big problem area China? is China, no yeah. doubt about it, with uh, the massive excess capacity that they have. But unless you have uh, tariffs in place or quotas in place, they have a way of transferring these the, the steel goods to other countries and find them into our country. So even countries that are um, good allies with the United States, they don't do a good job on their borders, so the steel, this excess capacity, finds its way into our allies' countries, and then it gets transferred into our country. We often refer to the whack-a-mole situation, where China, even though on paper there might be two to three percent of the imports, that's all, but they'll ship to countries like Vietnam, for example, where more more tons came into the United States from shipped into the United States from Vietnam than Vietnam actually produced. Mm. So well, you can't really affect the trade situation and look, unless you look at it in a global standpoint. You have to look at every one of the, the countries and have to be included because they're not all fo following the rules. Yeah, I, I wonder, speaking of those countries, uh, you know, we just had the Consul General of, of Canada in town uh, just last week saying, yeah, but wait a minute, we're friends, we're, we're, we're allies, we're getting caught up in all of this and that's not really, it's not really fair to us. Well, we're great anymore. friends, they're great allies, but they need to take a closer look at their borders and they need to make sure what's coming into their country and belongs to come into their country and, and respect the rules of So that really is one of the concerns, that there's yeah. a flow through Canada from other places. And from other, South Korea, a great ally as well. Yeah. Now they, there are quotas in place in South Korea and uh, so, so we're seeing benefits from that because, again, they're great allies too. 
But in the trade front, we've been, let's face it, taken advantage of for a very long time. Again, we've been in steel in a trade war for some 30 years. And so now this is a bit of a level set to get us back on track. And when we have a level playing field, our employers, our steel workers compete with anybody in the world. You mentioned a little bit in the first segment, what, but what's it really meant in, in recent months for the last year or so with U.S. Steel, not just here in our region, but kind of across your footprint? What's, what has it enabled you to do while you have this, uh, this Well, umbrella? in 15 and 16, we were turning a lot of things off, and we've been able to turn on a couple of blast furnaces at Granite City. That's 800 jobs there. Um, a pipe mill in, uh, at Lone Star in Texas. There's 140 jobs there. Fairfield, where we had an electric arc furnace that we were constructing, was turned off. Hmm. And now we're going to bring and, and start that up, that construction up, and it's going to be 150 jobs that we'll add there. So it's clearly in create, creating better opportunities for our employees, and plus we're investing some $2 billion over a four-year time horizon and uh, making our facilities much better than and, than what they have before. In fact, we committed to Gary, Indiana, some $750 million, and I'd like to do the same thing here right in, uh, in the Mon Valley as well. We'd love to hear an investment of those kinds of numbers, that's for sure. David Burrett, the CEO of U.S. Steel, thanks so much. Thanks for having really me. Really appreciate it. Yeah. And when we return, Allegheny Health Network builds a foundation in pediatrics, what it means to families and to our region. Please stay with us.